Um, all right, so um, why don't we start with a brief intro of ourselves, and um, I'd like to also hear a short elevator pitch of uh, what you're working on, your project. I'm sure many are familiar, but it would be nice to have your um, own definition of it. So I'll start with myself. I'm John from Delphi Digital. Um, we provide cutting edge uh, crypto research, and we are strong uh, um, supporters of this modular paradigm. Hello, uh, I'm Proto Lemta. I work at Optimism as a researcher. Um, with Optimism, we're working on a new upgrade called Back Bedrock. And this simplifies the protocol by modularizing, by taking apart the rollup logic from the execution logic that we know as GAF. And uh, as part of this, we also have this new fault proof tag that will uh, basically secure the withdrawals from the rollup to the layer one. All right, hi, I'm Josh. Uh, I'm an engineer at Celestial Labs, where I lead the Sevmos team. Um, so I'm not participating on the L1 data layer of Celestia. I'm working on, um, if you recall back to Mustafa's slides or Eric's slides, the Sevmos section, which is a sovereign roll-up focused um, for settlement. So for roll-ups to actually settle onto, and as part of that, we're using fraud proofs to um, actually kind of guarantee the security of that sovereign roll-up. I'm Emily, I work at Fuel Labs, uh, and we're building Fuel, which is the fastest modular execution layer, and we're building that using three different principles. That's UTXO-based parallel transaction execution, uh, the Fuel virtual machine, and then a really superior uh, software development experience. Thank you, guys, um, and Emily. Um, so, yeah, so I think, um, like, the the, now that we're in the roller paradigm, the difference between fraud proof and validity proofs, those are kind of overplayed and well known um, by a lot of people. But I think um, what's under discussed is how dispute resolution mechanisms, fraud proofs, and particular implementations of those um, differ from each other. So I'd like to start with that and have your opinions on like what are some design choices you've made when um, building these um, dispute resolution mechanisms. And if you may, uh, if any, uh, can you point out to some like unique aspects of your implementations of uh, dispute resolution? Right, so if you think of the early roll-up design, everyone approached it starting with the fraud proof and then later looking at like, what can we fit in into the execution. I think this really hurts UX. And over time, we have learned that users want some, like, they want, on Ethereum at least, they want Ethereum features. So they, they're looking for an EVM or they're looking for some specific execution environment without workarounds. And so to get rid of these workarounds, you have to approach it differently. You approach it with this, this type of VM that can run arbitrary code. Maybe it can run something else than optimism and uh, then do a fraud proof over this, this more generic binary of instructions. Yeah, so. I kind of view fraud proofs as a relatively more limited design space, I think, even than like ZK rollups, um, because you really have two ways of doing a fraud proof. You're either going to have re executing a transaction or you're going to have this like bisection interactive verification game. Um, for us, we're just using re, um, you know, re execution of a transaction, and that's you know, our kind of first attempt here, and that's for purely practical reasons. You know, we're building fraud proofs into the Cosmos SDK. The modular software architecture that Cosmos SDK provides is you can have consensus on one layer, and then you have your state machine on another layer. And so it's a relatively clean software design to just add that execution layer, that state machine Cosmos SDK layer, and say, okay, now light clients just have to have the ability to take your fraud proof, set up the state, the pre-state that you give them right from your state witnesses, and then actually re-execute the transaction just as any other Cosmos SDK-based um, execution layer would do it. So from, it's just an engineering practicality question here. At Fuel, we use a hybrid approach. So on one hand, we use a UTXO-based fraud proofs, and then on the other hand, uh, we also use um, interactive uh, verification game fraud proofs that are at the VM level. And we combine both of these to produce an outcome that works for our execution model. Uh, and we feel that this offers benefits because it means that we only need to necessarily rely on, say, a specification. And 
uh, other designs might rely on different technologies like interpreting to WASM and then doing fraud proofs with WASM. And those technologies would then rely on the limitations of what the WASM team wants to implement for the language. And uh, at Fuel, because we take this hybrid approach, we're just relying on the specification and that gives us some freedom. Interesting. Uh, I didn't know that about Fuel. Um, so just to like move on that, um, how far are you, do you think, uh, the, the, as an industry, we are in like a fraud-proof um, design space? Do you think, like, in near future, do you think like many of the problems are figured out, and these like implementations are going to like converge on on one design, get more commoditized, or do you think uh, we will see more and more like some different implementations getting divergent, like some different flavors of uh, of solutions here? So in terms of research, I think we're getting there. But in terms of products, there can be so much more. So when you think about all this new tech that enables uh, fraud proof over some arbitrary execution, you could do a lot more than just an EVM or just some specific type of smart contract VM. And so think of indexing services or other types of things that take layer one data and do these very expensive, like huge computations and then just prove that the execution is correct. This can be very meaningful to say adding an indexer to to a, a chain that wouldn't otherwise be possible with a smart contract. Yeah, from my view, I think we're pretty far along in research and like what I mentioned before, right? We have these two modes and you can kind of figure out how to implement those modes. From an actual like implementation perspective, I think it's a wider range because if you want to re-execute transactions, right, and you just pick that mode of fraud proof, then it's completely dependent on what execution environment you're using here, right? If you're going to use an EVM execution environment, you're going to have to have the ability to re-execute EVM transactions. Same for Cosm Wasm, same for Fuel, I'm assuming, right, where you're boxed in by what your execution environment is. And so in that space, we're actually pretty narrow in what we've researched because, quite frankly, on you know, um, blockchain right now, we have a pretty minimal number of general purpose execution environments. I mean, look, we have like Solana, we have Cosm, Wasm, we have Fuel, we have EVM, right? Those are kind of the big four that cover most of these things. And then we have Cairo, right? But you know, even Cairo team, right, is working on an EVM transpiler. So we're very small number of execution environments, and that's going to actually drive what kind of fraud proofs you need to be able to generate. Right, right. Yeah, I think um, we're going to see uh, some general theoretical ideas shake out and become more standardized. But then in terms of the actual implementations, I feel like those will be specialized to the tech particular technology stack. Um, Got it. Yeah. So we basically cannot uh, Im like consider fraud proofs in isolation from the execution models. Uh, I, I, I think you, you, everyone would agree with this. Um, so I'd like to uh, hear your experiences and like get more familiar on like what kind of constraints um, each pose on, on each other. So your fraud proof posing on, on your choice of execution model and vice versa. Some, what are some like constraints that you witnessed um, if you could share your experiences here, um, yeah. Right, so we started with the wrong approach, with a lot of constraints, and over time we like, kind of freed ourselves, going for more and more generic fraud proof. And so we're not doing really a fraud proof over the EVM, but rather we're doing a fraud proof over MIPS execution. You mm -hmm. can target a Go uh, program to different instruction sets. Uh, most commonly that's x86, but MIPS is this simple instruction set that you can do a fault proof over. And using this approach, you can compile the EVM implementation from GAF to this, types of this type of binary. But it doesn't mean that you cannot compile another type of Golang program to a binary to do a fault proof over. So over time, I really do think that we like, will think and we'll start thinking outside of the box, something that's not an, a regular smart contract VM, and do fault proofs over more interesting things. Would you would you think MIPS could become a standard here? Um, well, so unfortunately, at the time of development, we didn't have the ability to target risk phi with Go. But by now, in recent updates in Go, this risk phi instruction set is now supported. So there is this more elegant instruction set that we could support, and the differences are not that large. It's the same kind of family of instruction sets. Very interesting. 
Yeah, so in, in that vein, right, you know, I, I mentioned like we're limited by like the execution environment. We have to re-implement the execution environment. And the kind of elegant solution that the Optimism team has gone with, you know, and as I understand it, the Nitro VM is somewhat similar to that, where they essentially take the, the EVM, which is a somewhat hard to understand virtual machine, it's somewhat complex, right? And they compile it to, you know, this reduced instruction set computer, right? You know, which is MIPS, and then RISC-V would obviously be like the ideal, more modern one, but it's just not quite kind of ready yet from like an infrastructure perspective, right? Um, and that simplifies our problem. We still need to be able to have the ability to kind of deterministically like execute this thing, but then you're reduced to kind of a, a simpler problem because really what you're trying to figure out with a fraud proof, right, is how do I execute the minimal amount of state transitions and give essentially the smallest amount of state to, I'll say my light client, right, and then allow them to do the smallest amount of work to prove that I gave them an input and an output and they did an execution on that mm -hmm. input and they got a different output, right? Um, and I think we'll see this general purpose fraud proof hopefully kind of become the standard. And then what we have to see is, you know, this kind of software architecture on light clients being able to execute these, you know, general purpose things, right? Where right now you have to run a light client for you know, your optimistic rollup that has to be able to run this MIPS VM, right? And it has to tie into that execution. For us, you know, light clients in a Cosmos chain normally don't have any execution part in them. They don't have a state machine. We have to attach a state machine to them and have an ability to start up this state. So I think we'll see it at this engineering level of how can you easily tie into these optimistic roll-up chains um, to actually do more general purpose execution of a risk, you know, risk five or a MIPS based, um, you know, fraud proof. I see. I see. Yeah. So I touched on this a little bit earlier, but because at Fuel we have this hybrid approach, it allows us to um, be based on specifications instead of being based on running fraud proofs based on, say, Wasm or something like that. Um, so I feel like, in general, the fraud proof schemes that we'll see are going to be tied uh, to execution. Right. Yeah. And so, so in your hybrid model, would you say that it relates to your like data model, like you, the, the UTXO model, and, and and like would that be re relate like your choice of a hybrid fraud proof? Would that be related to your choice of like UTXO model or or those? Um, irrespective of, of themselves? Um, I would say that our choice of doing a UTXO model is what helped us choose to do the hybrid approach. Okay. Yeah. I see. So, um, uh, and so a lot of focus on, on the roll-up space is, and rightfully so, is focused on um, um, reducing this L1 footprint, right? When we like move from uh, single single round uh, fraud proof to 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 a bisection game, we try to like simplify the the basically the problem to a single instruction set that should go on chain. So this reduces the L1 footprint. But when we think about scaling as a holistic thing, um, really the the L1 footprint is a part of it, and and arguably it's not the it won't be the biggest part of it in the future, um, with, with with solutions like uh, like dank sharding, like with Celestia and like. Um, so, um, uh, a part of scaling is obviously the, the data model and execution model. So, what I'd like to know, what are some optimizations that you do uh, in this respect in your particular implementations? Uh, we right, so I do think optimistic rollups are in favor here of CK rollups, where if data do, does get very cheap, then we reduce our costs by basically 100%, like this, this is our primary cost. Execution only happens during the fault proof in the, the unhappy case. So in the happy case, you'll get very, very cheap transactions. And like in the best of world, you would combine ZK rollups and optimistic rollups. If we had like a ZK proof for arbitrary computation, like we can do with fault proofs, they can lag behind the optimistic rollup and reduce the dispute period by showing a validity proof to um, basically confirm the execution. Um, short term, I think the optimistic rollups are more powerful here with better arbitrary execution. And uh, so I'll we'll have to deal with the dispute period for now. Yeah, so I think answering your specific question of like, what are we doing to kind of specifically optimize our thing outside of the data layer, you know, as, you know, a, a project inside of Celestia, we're not really focused on that right now. You know, we're taking a somewhat naive approach to these roll-ups, to these op op optimistic roll-ups in the fraud proof, where we're just trying to generate a fraud proof, and we're assuming that the size will come in at such that we can post it on 
um, our data availability layer, and we're assuming our data availability layer gives us cheap enough data that we're not too worried about that. I think one of the interesting things is as data becomes cheaper, right, um, you know, as Proto mentioned, like, optimistic rollups start becoming more favorable because they have a higher cost of, you know, a quantity of data that needs to be posted on the L1 as an optimistic rollup. Right. Um, and when that kind of problem becomes better, like, the actual cost of generating a fraud proof also, or, or the complexity of that can become simpler. Because in this generic, you know, execution, you know, the, the Nitro VM is somewhat complicated to understand the bisection game. It's much easier to explain to someone, oh, I'm just going to give you a pre-state, you're going to do an execution, you're going to get a post-state. The reason you might want this, you know, interactive verification game is because you can get a smaller fraud proof, and if your data is expensive, you know, you could touch a lot of state in this fraudulent transaction. You could end up with a very, very large fraud proof, theoretically too large to even post in one block, right? And that's kind of an unacceptable um, situation. You know, that's what the Arbitrum people are talking about, right? They can cover fraud proof for transactions that are essentially larger than the total block space of Ethereum. But if we start having larger blocks on a data layer or really, really cheap data, you can kind of remove some of the optimizations that actually in the fraud proofs, because the assumption is you're not frequently posting fraud proofs. If we're posting fraud proofs like once a day, once a week, once a year, something is kind of wrong with <laughs> the economic incentive system here, right? So we can actually get simpler things and less optimized systems that are then easier to understand, easier to audit and verify if we get cheaper data. Right. Yeah, so uh, in terms of optimizations, there's really two things that come to mind for fuel. Uh, and that's one, we have the UTXO-based model that allows us to eliminate the need for a global state Merkle tree. And this allows us to scale um, quite generously. And the second thing is, in the actual uh, implementation, every contract has a corresponding address. And then to refer to these contracts, you refer to them using an address. And this allows us to take advantage of some of the properties that having a global state Merkle tree would allow you while still maintaining the UTXO based system where we don't actually need it. <laughs> Thanks for these. Um, yeah, I'll have one final question, and then I'll open it, uh, the panel to audience questions. So um, oftentimes in, in these crypto projects, there's like misconceptions. So what would be, uh, can you think of a, a common misconception related to your project or um, optimistic execution in, in general? Um, if you have any. If you don't, uh, feel free to pass this one. Sure, this is a spicy question. Everyone thinks different things about rollups. I think, in general, like you could say there is a misconception that um, non-interactive or interactive rollups, one is better for some weird reason. In the end, I do think it really depends on the dispute period. Like, if you have this kind of dispute period, then you'll ha see differences. Uh, or if you don't have this dispute period, you'll see differences. So like in the sovereign rollup model or things closer to Celestia, it will actually matter to, to be able to do a non-interactive fraud proof. Whereas on Ethereum mainnet, you always have a limited EVM. And having interaction is actually a good thing because if you have a week anyway to do like this anti-censorship fraud proof, like if you take the time, then you might as well use that to reduce the, the cost of layer one. So in, in, when in the case where like the, the fraud proof is distributed over the P2P layer, you am I getting yes. it right? Yeah. If you want to be off-chain, you definitely want to be non-interactive right. or something close to that. Whereas if you want to do this on-chain, interactive is actually more optimal. Makes sense. Yeah, so for like the Celestia model, if we go into like the L1, 2, 3, right, we're deploying that settlement layer, which is itself a sovereign role. So in this way, we're, we're boxed into using this non-interactive fraud proof because we don't have a place where a smart contract can live that would essentially mediate this interactive game. Um, but to answer your, your question on, on like misconceptions, I think there's a little bit of like this assumption that like a 14-day like latency window or whatever to like um, the, the verification um, or, or the, the trust of the mm -hmm. um, roll-up transactions. Like th some people don't know. I think that that's like a completely arbitrary number that was picked. <laughs> like that, there was not there's not good backing research on like this is what <laughs> happens if you extend it to 21 days. This is what happens if you shorten it to seven days. Like people just picked like 14 days and like ah good enough that seems fine right? right. But we haven't seen like a live network generating large quantities of fraud proofs to see like is 14 days actually long enough? And if you think about the amount of transactions going through, 
you know, these networks, right? We're in, you know, if we, if we look at like Starkware, like we're in like tens to hundreds of billions of dollars of transactions. The reality is you just need one honest full node in the network to be re-executing all transactions. They should be able to find an invalid transaction. This latency window doesn't really need to be that long, mm -hmm. you know, for, for you to have, you know, a pretty large set of people that are, you know, economically incentivized to check these transactions. Like you could probably be, you know, order of like days or, or even hours because like, these liveness failures. Like you'd have to have the assumption of there is no honest watcher in your network executing the transactions, but you're still producing transactions. It's just not a real world situation in like the modern world of how trivial it is to spin up software. If right. the thing that can generate a fraud proof is open source software, if all of them are down on the network and you have a 24 hour window, there's like 10 cloud services you can go to at any hour of the night, buy a VM, download the software and execute against the chain in that period. Like, I just don't see liveness issues being something where we need 14 days to resolve this. Right, so I think the 14 days number or seven days for some, uh, it really depends on the censorship ability of the against the fraud proof. Yep. So if you have a fraud proof of chain, you have a very different model than if say if you have a fraud proof that depends on miners, including the, the challenges. Yeah, and I guess so we're biased, you know, in this sovereign roll-up environment, right, where we have a relatively easy workaround to the censorship resistance because you can pass it to the data layer, and the assumption is that the data layer is not necessarily incentivized to, you know, censor transactions for, um, you know, your roll-up above it. Obviously, that's still, you know, uh, an area where you can have censorship if there's sufficient money to be gained um, by censoring, right? Yeah, but good, good color. Uh, I, 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 I like the a angle that you, you put on this. Emily, do you have any? Um? Yeah, so uh, speaking particularly about fuel, I feel like there's this misconception that fuel is an optimistic roll-up first, when in reality it's a modular execution layer first. Uh, but I don't think that this is a problem that's specific to fuel, I think, because modular layers and the modular blockchain is this new exciting thing that's becoming more prevalent in the space that we are knowing and working with. Um, I think it's, there's, uh, there may be misconceptions about what the definitions mean and I think that's why days like today are very important so that we can uh, like get excited about it and bring everyone together with the community. Yep. So, um, if anyone have any questions, now's the time. Questions? Don't be shy. No one? This shows that fraud proofs are already answered. We've already <laughs> solved all solved the problems. All the problems. <laughs> I think there's one. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Uh, thank you for the, for the panel. Uh, I have a question here. I was asking Fuel Labs folks uh, on the background, but still question for you all. Uh, let's say I have a Celestial Light client on the phone. It's just a data availability layer, OK? And there is a DAX deployed on a full node, basically Uniswap. And I want, with my phone, to take, like to plug any execution layer and talk to that. DAX, is it, do you think it is viable in this year or a year after, or it just like a realm after five or six years. Thank you. So I guess when you say a phone here, it's a relatively <laughs> nebulous thing because I, I, I don't think hardware limitations of phones right now are going to be a limiting factor. I mean, like what the hell does like an iPhone 13 have from a processing power perspective that's insufficient to do validation or, or execution of transaction? Um, I think your actual problem is going to be kind of from a software perspective. Like, can I get my software onto iOS? Probably not. Can you get your software onto Android? Probably if you root the phone, yeah, then you can probably you know, jam it into Linux somehow. But then actually an interesting problem is, you know, something that I don't think we talk about that much is like cross-architecture things. You know, you can just transpile it to like ARM, but you do get layers of different architectures in here. But I, I don't see any technical limitations for that. I, I think we're into the limitations of Apple and Google control you know, what, 98, 99% of all phones, and they're relatively restrictive on the kind of software you can deploy. I don't know if anyone's gotten blockchain execution nodes onto a phone. I don't know where that falls into an app store category. Well, so if you have a phone, obviously you, you, 
might want to run a full node, but this is what light clients are for, to reduce the resources. So if you want to submit a transaction to a DAX from your phone, and if you want it to be confirmed on the data layer, then there will probably some be some software roll-up that will try and specialize in giving you like a soft confirmation very, very quickly for the DAX to have like a good UX, and then to show you a proof that the data is being confirmed. And like I think this is really just a, it should be a software problem. And I think this is like a question for like maybe a, a software and roll-up panel, or like basically like the execution layer more so than the execution fraud proof tag. We have time for one more question. Yeah, we got one over there. Someone over here? Yep. Over there. Yellow. Oh, Earth. there you go. Oh, oh, they did work. Nice. Um, so, like, I often think about uh, like app-specific chains as not really being like whole chains, but just like a roll-up that's built on top of like a Celestium or or something like that. And like, each application will just run their own roll-up and etc. I wonder how much like you guys have like thought about that. I think especially with the people that are building more like general-purpose solutions. Yeah. So that's pretty easy for us to answer as like, like trying to do like fraud proof in the Cosmos SDK, right? Like it's just a Cosmos transaction. And as long as, you know, we can generate a fraud proof based off of like, you know, the state tree that, you know, we'll get in the Cosmos SDK, then it should be fine for app specific chains. I think that should go for kind of all of these. It's just as long as you have the ability to re-execute a transaction for that app specific chain, which really just involves a light client being able to load the state and execute whatever software makes up the app specific chain, it shouldn't be more difficult than that. All right, let's uh, call it there. So thank you guys. Um, that was an awesome panel. Thank you.